All right, let's get started. Uh, I've handed out the homework assignment that you've got due next Tuesday. You've got a week. Um, the first problem, we're going to do an example in class today. That's why I asked you to bring your laptops if you had them. That's related to the first problem. And then on Thursday, we'll cover the other two topics for, that, that go along with problems two and three. Um, also, a week from today, we've got our second exam. And that will cover the material through this assignment. Um, so any questions about those announcements? Yeah. No, it'll just be since the second exam until now. Uh, the first exam until now, right. And uh, I'll talk more on Thursday about uh, what you should prepare, like as far as equation sheets and things like that. Uh, open book just means the exam itself is more complicated. So we'll see. Yeah. All right. Um, we didn't get to these slides last time, so let's take a quick look at them before we start talking about hydrographs. Um, there's a couple of different overland flow types, depending on where the water is coming from. And uh, Hortonian overland flow is caused when there is uh, saturation at the ground level, and so the infiltration rate is exceeded. And by the way, I gave you back your homework assignment, and it seemed like almost everyone in class missed a at least two points on the assignment. And that's because on the, uh, the second infiltration problem, it turned out that the precipitation rate was less than the initial infiltration rate. Um, so that's to say, remember, the green amped method assumes continuous ponding. The green amped method assumes that from, from time zero, there's more rainfall than the soil can infiltrate. But it turns out that on that second problem, that wasn't true. And you wouldn't know it unless you checked to see, like, what's the infiltration rate at time equals 0 0.05 hours, something like that. And if, if you checked on it, um, because you're given the, you're given the uh, precipitation rate, and it didn't say in the problem statement to assume continuous ponding, like it did in the first problem statement. The first problem statement, I, I told you, you can assume that the infiltration rate is uh, less than the precipitation rate. But I didn't uh, tell you to make that assumption in the second homework problem. So what you needed to do is look at the precipitation rate to see how does that compare to the rate of infiltration. And so actually to calculate the cumulative infiltration on that second infiltration problem, it was just the infiltration rate. I'm sorry, it was the uh, precipitation rate tel uh, times the time period, time to ponding. So T sub P is time to ponding. And most people were able to calculate that fine. <clears throat> but what I'm saying is, is that here at the surface, the rain was less than the infiltration rate. And so there wasn't, uh, there wasn't continuous ponding. And so we weren't maximizing the infiltration rate. In the green amped method, normally, that's saying you have so much water at the surface that how much water gets into the ground is slowed down by the soil itself. How much can the soil absorb? But in that second problem, the rain was less. And so how much water gets into the soil isn't governed by the rate the soil can accept the water, but it's governed by how much precipitation is actually coming from the sky. And so the infiltration. depth on that second problem was just as easy as time to ponding times the precipitation rate. And that will always be true when infiltration is greater than precipitation. And so right now, if we look out the window, it's raining very lightly. And so right now, probably, the precipitation rate is less than the soil's infiltration rate. The soil can accept more water than the sky is giving it. And so uh, if we wanted to find out how much water gets into the soil, it has nothing to do with the soil's maximum capacity to absorb water. Because it's raining so little that the soil's maximum capacity doesn't govern. What governs is how much the precipitation was. And so, if you were wondering about those two points on the homework assignment, that's, 
that's the issue there, is that um, you weren't given the assumed continuous ponding um, card on that second problem. So here, when we're talking about overland flow, overland flow occurs when there is more precipitation than infiltration. So here, Hortonian overland flow means that uh, the green amped method could be invoked because there is continuous ponding when you have overland flow. And so what we call Hortonian overland flow is water on top of the surface of the soil because the soil right below the uh, surface is saturated. On the other hand, saturation overland flow, if we look at the subsurface when it's raining, here is our groundwater table, the little triangle and these hash marks here mean that there's a free surface of water. So above this free surface, this is the Vados zone or the zone of aeration. Below that is the zone of saturation. So you can see that the water table is higher on this side than it is over there. So anytime the water level is high on one side and low on the other, that means that the water is going to be migrating through the soil grains towards wherever the the piezometric head is the lowest. And so the water is moving towards this stream because the stream is draining it down gradient. It's moving the water away towards the ultimate sink. And so if the water level is rising and rising and rising in the subsurface, you can see eventually the water table gets so high that it starts seeping out at the surface. In addition to making its way underground, the water just sort of comes for forth at the surface here and that's saturation overland flow when, um, when water's running over the surface. But it's not because, you know, in this case, it, it could be possible that the infiltration rate of the soil is greater than the precipitation rate. But we're still seeing overland flow because the water table's not, it, the soil isn't saturated at the top. Whereas in this drawing here, this shaded gray that's right at the surface, that means that the soil is saturated the wetting front, remember, all of the pores are full of water as that wetting front makes its way downward. And so here, the overland flow is because there's saturation at the ground level. And here, there isn't saturation except for where the water table is emerging. So good quiz question there. Explain the difference between Hortonian overland flow and saturation overland flow. Or Maybe, what are the two kinds of overland flow? Explain how they're different. Those would be two good quiz questions. Any questions about this? So just here's another way of looking at what's going on in the subsurface during a wet weather event. You can see that the water table isn't flat. The water table is perched. It sort of follows where the ground level is but it's lowest where there is a channel conveying the water downstream. This channel, the stream flow, is sort of like the sink. Um, all of the flow in the subsurface migrates towards that stream so that it can be discharged. Um, just some different terminology, sometimes used to describe the same thing we were talking about on the previous slide, base flow is groundwater that's making its way into the stream even when it's dry. And you'll notice that there are certain streams, um, streams that are perennial, streams that are there even when it's not wet, you wonder, well, where is the water coming from? It, it hasn't been raining. The soil at the ground level is very dry. So why there's no overland flow, but base flow is just groundwater that migrates towards the stream even in extended dry periods of time. Uh, return flow is, uh, is similar. It's return flow and base flow could be used interchangeably. Those two def definitions aren't much different. But overland flow, on the other, other hand, uh, saturation overland flow, shown here in this diagram, is just when the uh, water um, during a storm makes its way over the surface towards the stream. So hydrograph is a graph of water, hydrograph. Very easy, right? And uh, we're going to be looking at today and next time ways to estimate what the hydrograph will look like. And uh, just this past Sunday, I put another stream gauge in the field. Maybe I'll try and bring some data next week to show you what it looks like. But um, I've got this little instrument that's uh, 
It's about the size of a remote control, and um, I just can drop it in water, and it measures the pressure so precisely that it knows the depth of water in a stream. And so what I do is I put it in a PVC pipe, drill holes in the PVC pipe, wire it up to a cinder block, and throw the cinder block in a stream. And actually, I also tie the cinder block to a tree so that if it really gets roaring, it doesn't push the cinder block downstream and I lose my gauge. So it just records in, I, I can uh, tell it how often to look at what the pressure is. In this case, I'm having it measure the pressure in one minute increments. So it's got enough data on board that it can measure for 15 days in one minute increments what's the pressure. And I have another gauge that's measuring the atmospheric pressure because the atmospheric pressure is varying over time. And so if I subtract the atmospheric pressure from whatever the submerged gauge is telling me the pressure is, then it tells you what's the depth of water. So I can know what the real hydrograph looks like in these two streams that I've got gauged right now. But we don't always have the luxury of stream gauges at the location we're interested in. So take, for example, West Virginia. It's a pretty big state. And hydraulics and hydrology are really important because we have a lot of road crossings at streams. But in the state, there are only about 100 stream gauges in the entire state, about 100. And there are tens of thousands of locations where we should be interested, if, if not hundreds of thousands, of locations where we need to know what the flow rate's going to be at a certain location. Every time a stream crosses a road, we have to know what the flow rate's going to be in order to plan on what should be at that intersection. Should it be a culvert? Should it be a small bridge? How big of a culvert? How big of a bridge? And so we have to estimate, since we don't have gauges to tell us it, what the history of the flow is, we have to find some way to guess or predict what the hydrograph is going to look like so that we make a pipe large enough to convey all of this discharge. So this is a typical hydrograph shape. And in this diagram, they've broken down the hydrograph into pieces to explain what, where the water comes from in the typical hydrograph shape. And so we were just talking about base flow and how base flow is the water that's moving through a stream even when it's dry. So in this hydrograph, you can see that the flow rate is flat. Here's the rainfall that's going to cause this big peak. And so here's the rainfall hiatograph. Here is the runoff hydrograph. So the rainfall hiatograph, it looks like there were three rainfall periods. It rained a little bit, then it rained a lot, and then it rained a medium amount. So the three different segments of rainfall. Um, this must be, this hydrograph must be somewhat downstream of the watershed or um, there is a delay here because you can see it starts raining but then for a certain period nothing's happening. So the constant flow rate that's in the channel even before we see the rising limb, that's the base flow. And remember in the previous diagram what we learned base flow is, is that's the subsurface water that migrates towards the stream just because the stream is the low point in the watershed. All of the water that's trapped in the soil voids in the saturation zone is always moving towards whatever the low point in the watershed is. It moves more slowly than water at the surface, but even water underground is moving towards the outlet. That's the base flow. So then the rising limb means that all of a sudden, water is starting to converge towards the outlet. And let me draw the typical watershed shape. So we have a series of streams that are helping to drain the watershed. So it started raining. Let's just assume it started raining over the entire watershed. There's a big cloud that's covering the whole watershed. And it starts raining everywhere at the same time. And what you know about time of concentration and, uh, and related topics is that it, it takes a while for water to start moving towards the outlet. So outlet means this is the lowest point in the watershed. It's where all of the water is migrating towards. And so this raindrop that's far away that has to make its way over the surface, then it gets into the channel and starts moving more quickly. And it's speeding up. As it gets further along, it's speeding up because there's more water. And so more of the flow area is farther away from the bottom of the channel where the resistance is. So as the flow rate increases, so does the velocity. And now it's finally at the outlet. So if we timed that with a stopwatch, that would be our time of concentration. 
So here, as the discharge is just barely starting to increase, the reason why it's gradually increasing in that rising limb is because more and more of the area is starting to contribute. Here at the very highest peak, this peak is when all of a sudden, all of the areas in the watershed are finally draining towards the outlet. Like the raindrop that took its way, that took from here and is going in, and the one from here and is going in, all of the areas finally are arriving at the outlet at the same time at that peak of the hydrograph. And so saturated overland flow is related to flow over the surface, but when the rainfall event is finished and there is no longer um, an, an excess of rainfall, and let me revisit that definition, rainfall excess. Who can remember what rainfall excess means? How is rainfall excess different from rainfall? Another fantastic quiz question. Rainfall excess causes the runoff, so you're right to think that the two are intimately connected. I'd say that rainfall excess causes runoff, but I wouldn't say that's how I define rainfall excess. So you're close. You're on the right track. Gabriella, do you remember what rainfall excess is? No? Okay. You were smiling. I thought you did. Right. Yeah, okay. So it's... Rainfall, it's when you have more rainfall than infiltration. So rainfall minus infiltration minus what else? Do you remember the name of any other abstractions besides infiltration? Evaporation? Good. What other abstractions are there? Evapotranspiration, okay. And what's the difference between evaporation, which I wrote, and transpiration? That's right. Transpiration is when plants are exhaling moisture. Just like the way you check if somebody's still alive is you put a mirror up to their mouth to see if you can see the moisture, you know, on the glass. <sighs> from the breathing. Plants do the same thing. Maybe that's a test to see if your plants are still alive. Put a mirror up to the plants and see if water accumulates. They don't, ex they don't transpire as much as humans. Okay, infiltration, evaporation, transpiration. What other abstractions are there? Interception, okay. What's interception? That's right. It's when plants or buildings block the rainfall and prevent it from getting to the ground. I think of, uh, I have got two more in mind. Okay, uh, well, I guess we could say groundwater recharge is the same as infiltration. Um, but, but surface recharge, um, like ponding, ponding, and then the other thing I had in mind was surface wetting. Oh, okay, sure. Yeah, yeah, that's true, you know, like on a long-term basis over a big watershed than large volume users. I, we did talk about that. Large volume users. Uh, and we talked about uh, agricultural demands, you know, like livestock and watering plants, um, crops. In a, in a short term, like in a, a storm that just lasts a day or something, the big ones are going to be infiltration. I mean, infiltration is the biggest one, but all the rest of these are abstractions. So rainfall excess is rainfall minus all of the things that aren't going to uh, be there when you have runoff. You know, where else did the water go is the abstractions. All the other places it can go besides runoff. What? I mean, it's rainfall minus all those things. So yeah. It's pretty much covered everything. 
Well, as long as we list all the places that the other places that the water can go. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so back to the hydrograph. When the uh, when the rainfall excess is all used up, meaning that no longer is there more precipitation than all these other things. Now, we still have more water going through the channel than we used to, but interflow is when you're getting water coming towards the stream in soil voids that usually are dry. And so interflow means that the, uh, if we go back to here, so you see wet weather. Look at the difference between wet weather and the dry weather. Where's the water table at? Here in wet weather, the water table is higher than it was in dry weather. So this water table is elevated. So even when it stops raining and there's no longer surface water going over there, there's no longer saturation, uh, there's no longer um, Hortonian overland flow, we still have to get rid of the, wa the extra water that's underground. And so that's what this interflow is. This interflow comes from the extra water that was underground finally making its way into the channel. And then the falling limb, I, I don't know, this is maybe arguable that they're showing this is base flow. But they're, they're saying there's some separation line where you can say that, uh, that the water table is back to where it normally would be. And so that's what we call base flow. I don't know why they haven't drawn that as a horizontal line. There's probably some technical reason. But um, interflow is definitely the, uh, the water table being higher than normal, and we're having to drain that out. So those are the three different components in a, in a, a hydrograph. And uh, so the shape of it, how, you know, this is a, um, it looks like a pretty steep peak. But here in West Virginia, when I'm doing watershed modeling, the peaks are even more steep than that. Like when I do a, a prediction of what a storm is going to do to a stream, it looks like, bam, there's a huge peak and it goes down really quickly. Um, maybe I'd adjust the peak, I'd adjust it to look like this maybe. So it's really steep in West Virginia. The, the, they call it a flashy watershed. and so. The, uh, the shape of a hydrograph is determined by the abstractions. And there's this quote in the book that I really like. I put it in verbatim. It says, when the local abstractions have been accomplished. And I thought that was kind of a funny phrase to describe the abstractions, like it's maybe a to-do list or something. It's raining, and the precipitation has all these other things it has to get out of the way before it can finally start causing runoff. So when the local abstractions have been accomplished for a small area of a watershed, water begins to flow over land as overland flow, and eventually into a drainage channel in a gully or stream valley. And we've got a couple of pictures of a, uh, on the left, this is a photo of uh, what's called a wadi in the UAE. This is one of the few places in the United Arab Emirates where I lived for a couple of years that you can actually see vegetation that's naturally growing out in you know, like very dry, mountainous uh, desert area. There's uh, some base flow here. That there's enough water coming through this channel continuously that actually vegetation grows. And it's pretty strange in a country that there's hardly any naturally growing vegetation to be walking through the mountains and see that. And then here's a, a picture in West Virginia of some rainfall excess at work. So. How, how big is a hydrograph going to be? Uh, what is the shape of the hydrograph going to look like? Well, it depends on how big the area is. Are we talking about the 13-acre watershed in your backyard or the Mississippi River Basin? Uh, the slope of the channel, and actually, for that matter, the slope of the watershed has an impact on a hydrograph shape. Because we've drawn here just this typical illustration of travel time. If it's a really steep surface, the water is going to move more quickly towards the outlet, and the hydrograph will have a much more distinct, quick, flashy shape than if it's a flat watershed. The water is going to be moving more slowly. A hydraulic roughness 
is talking about what's the Manning's N value of the surface that the water is flowing over and in the channel. So is it a uh, uh, very smooth, and I'm trying to think, what would be a smooth, okay, like an urban watershed is relatively smooth, you know, a paved surface, a hydraulic roughness of concrete, we think concrete's rough when you fall off your motorcycle and are sliding down the road, it feels pretty rough. But hydraulically, that concrete surface is much more smooth than a grassy field would be. The Manning's N value for concrete is low, 0 0.013, whereas a grassy field could be 0 0.05 or higher. So that depends on, it dictates how quickly the water moves through the environment. Other things is, uh, are there, is there storage? Uh, inside of the stream, remember that the terrace that has all the little ponds as you go downward through the channel, uh, the length of the stream, channel density. So there's a lot of things that affect what the shape of that hydrograph is, and we have to have some way to account for these in our model. Remember, a model is a word that we use to describe a fictional representation of reality. It can be an equation, a model could be an equation where we're using some equation to predict what happens in real life, like F equals MA is a model. That's a model of what happens when you're applying a force to a certain mass. Well, it accelerates. And F equals MA tells us the rate that acceleration can occur. So that's an example of one model. Another example of a model would maybe be a little car. You know, a, a matchbox car is a model of a real life car. So we're going to try and put together models that predict what the watershed is doing. And um, sometimes they're just conceptual models that explain how the pieces fit together. Like this is a conceptual model over on the whiteboard when we're talking about all the different places the water can go. This is to give us an idea of the concepts behind the hydrology. But what we're really, the direction we're heading in is trying to come up with ways to predict the shape of the hydrograph. So here are some different hydrograph shapes. And our models need to account for the slopes that are involved. And so this is showing if you have a surface slope that is steep, then the peaks are going to arrive more quickly and they're going to be higher. So there's two things. If I was giving you a quiz and I said, here are two different surface slopes, what would be the difference in the hydrograph shape? Then the two characteristics I'd look for in the hydrograph shape is that if you have a steeper surface slope, the peak of the hydrograph arrives more quickly and the peak is higher because all of the water arrives at the same time, so to speak. Not all, but more of it arrives at the same time than uh, in the case of the shallow surface slope. Okay, so let's consider hydraulic roughness. So why is the hydrograph shape looking like this for a more rough surface? What explains that? What is it about the more rough surface that accounts for this hydrograph shape? Okay, so over this, over this surface, the water has a slower velocity because it's, it's more rough, meaning that there's more resistance. Think of Manning's equation. Manning's equation says if you have more roughness, uh, Manning's equation, V equals area, no, that's when it's flow rate, 1 over N area to the wetted perimeter to the 2 thirds slope to the 1 half. Okay, so N is the roughness. If you have a, uh, a big roughness, then the velocity will be small because that's in the denominator. So the, this more rough surface is going to slow down the flow velocity over the surface. And so um, it, the flow has more time to spread out. To uh, There's more time for diffusion in the channel. And so it's not arriving at the outlet so quickly. You'll notice that the time of concentration, the time to peak is further to the right, and the peaks are lower. So we see the effect of storage. These little ponds here are meant to represent the, the, uh, 
uh, regenerative conveyance channel that we've seen before, where we're trying to not only slow down how quickly the water moves over the surface, but also hopefully get a little bit of infiltration out of it as well. Because if you've got more ponding, if there's a, a greater depth of water, you're forcing uh, more water into the soil pores, and so that'll also be an effective way of reducing the peak. Drainage density. Okay, drainage density. What drainage density is talking about is how many stream channels are there. Okay, so here I've drawn just one main branch and then a couple of secondary branches. But what if we had lots of little streams? So what if we had a stream here and there was a stream there, a stream here? If we have more streams, then how does that affect the overland flow distance? Well, it reduces the overland flow. So what I mean is this, this stream, the, the raindrop that used to have to travel a really long distance before it finally got into the channel, if there's lots of streams everywhere, now it only has to travel a little bit and then it immediately gets into the channel. And once it's in the channel, it moves very fast. And so if you have a high density, lots of streams, meaning there's less overland flow, then the, then the peak hydrograph is higher and it arrives sooner than if you have a low density. Feel free to let me know if you've got any questions. Um, and then channel length. The longer the channel, um, it's like, the, the way to explain it is, if I have a really long channel, so uh, what if I pour in, if I pour in a bucket of water just all at once? Here I've, I've got my water and I pour it in. If I've got a long channel, it's going to arrive, some of it, it's sort of going to spread out. Like it's, it's going to be spreading out like this and slowly moving towards the end. But if it's just a short channel and I pour the bucket in like this, then it, it's all going to arrive to the outlet so fast. It sort of spreads out. They call that diffusion. The, the flow diffuses uh, the longer the channel is. And so here, if you've got a really long river, um, the, the storm hydrograph sort of just spreads out compared to if it's a short channel length. Then it arrives more quickly. These are really fantastic drawings over here, and I'm sure that they, uh, they got the message to you 100% clearly. So I just, I won't even elaborate any further. That's how confident I am in my artistry. Yeah? So does channel length affect anything but the time axis? Um, so should those graphs be the exact same? No, no, this one's lower. This is lower. Yeah, it's lower. Mm -hmm. Good question. And it, it couldn't be one without the other. You know, it, it, if you make it longer and it's the same amount of water, then it has to also be lower. Yeah, I'm glad you asked. Because it, it's not as obvious with that one as it is with the others. And it's probably, you need a microscope to see it on the, the handouts. It's probably pretty small. Okay, um, so here's some other things that can change the hydrograph shape. What are, these, what are these things called above the hydrograph? What's this? That's right, hydrograph, which is a, a representation of the rainfall. And so how are these two different storms different? Well, the first storm, most of the water is early in the day. The second storm, most of the water is late in the day. So this is the same watershed and the same amount of water. Well, maybe not the same amount. But it's just showing that temporal distribution, which means if you have most of the storm, it, most of the precipitation happening early versus late, that's going to affect the shape of the hydrograph. Like on the right, this hydrograph on the right is a gradual increase, not because of the basin characteristics necessarily, but it's a gradual increase just because the, uh, this first little bit of the storm kind of wetted the surface and accomplished the abstractions. 
And all of those abstractions were filled, and then all of a sudden, bam, you got a, a big pulse of rainfall at the end of the day, and that's what's accounting for this large peak at the end, and then a, an equally rapid drop off in the hydrograph. So temporal distribution. Um, now here, this figure I really like because it's showing the idea of a cloud can sometimes cover the whole watershed if you've got a big cloud formation and a small watershed. But it's not always the case that it's raining everywhere in the watershed. If you have a large watershed, um, like the Ohio River Basin, for example, it's not going to be raining everywhere in the Ohio River Basin at the same time. It's basically physically impossible uh, for, for the rain to be everywhere. And if it is raining everywhere, it's probably a much lower intensity than a storm like this. A, a small storm that's really concentrated, that could be a lot of rainfall all at once, but it's far away from the outlet, you can see. And so storm A, the hydrograph takes a long time to arrive because it's at the far edge of the watershed. And then you'll notice it's smaller because it's also getting that point across that it's not always going to be raining everywhere in the entire boundaries. So that's a really good depiction. I like that figure a lot. Um, and then this is kind of an interesting idea too, and that is think about if there's clouds above in the air, and what if the storm is here and it starts moving from B towards A? So it started raining on B first, and then the clouds are moving south, and the clouds finally are over A. So what it would look like, the hydrograph is going to be delayed because we started at the outlet and then our move, we started at the far end of the watershed at B and then are moving towards A. So that means it takes some extra time for the water to migrate towards A compared to the, if it was the other direction. If it's raining over A, then the hydrograph is arriving sooner because it's already getting wet at the outlet. But let me ask you this. So that explains the timing of it. Why is the second curve, the B to A curve, why is it taller? Let's say that the storm is precipitating the same amount. So it's not because of different rainfall amounts. What's that? OK, that's right. So it's sort of like the rain is moving that way at the same time that the cloud is. It's kind of related to this. Like, what if we poured in the water, but as we poured, we were moving the bucket also? So the water is moving towards the outlet, and the location that we're moving, the location we're pouring is moving towards the outlet. All of a sudden, there would be this big wave at the outlet if we're pouring the bucket as the water is also moving. So it would be a more sudden peak, depending on the, the direction of the storm. And, that's something that's so hard to measure. Like the research I'm doing right now, I only know when it rains and how much. But I don't know what direction the rainfall was coming from. And so I can't do anything to predict this sort of effect because I don't have the data that tells me whether the storm is coming from the north or coming from the south. And it really can matter, especially for a big watershed. For small watersheds, it doesn't matter as much that, than it does for a large watershed. Maybe. Maybe I can go try and find the radar data for in the past. But um, you know, the, the, the nice graphs that I can look up for right now or an hour ago, those are much harder, harder to find for three months ago. Or you know, at least I, I, maybe they're out there, the tapes of them. But um, yeah, maybe. OK. So this idea, again, to reinforce what is rainfall excess, it is Precipitation, here's the, here's the Haito graph of precipitation. And then if we subtract out the infiltration, then the amount of precipitation over and above the infiltration is the rainfall excess. <coughs> so you're asking, well, what about all the other abstractions? What about evaporation, transpiration, interception, ponding, surface wetting, and so on? Well, those are minor compared to infiltration. Infiltration is the biggest. <coughs> It's the biggest abstraction. And so 
here in this conceptual diagram, this is just a concept here. It's saying that the rainfall excess is the hydrograph above the infiltration. This is the rate of infiltration. Um, and you can see it's declining rate of infiltration because the soil is uh, less eager to absorb water the more saturated the soil becomes. So it has a declining rate of infiltration. So increase, infiltration decreases over time for those reasons that we've just discussed. Now remember, hydrograph is different from a hydrograph. Hydrograph is of rainfall. Hydrograph is a figure that establishes runoff. So here is a, uh, a flow chart that shows how you put together a runoff hydrograph. And it, it's, if you are trying to predict your rainfall hydrograph, you don't have an actual instrument in the field measuring the runoff. You start by trying to know what is the rain amount over time. And so you have to have a temporal distribution of precipitation. And then you subtract out the infiltration amounts. And we're going to uh, talk about a method called the SCS approach, where it tries to predict what infiltration is going to be there based on what kind of land use you've got, like is a watershed full of pavement and asphalt parking lots, or is a watershed full of forest and grassy fields. So if you know the characteristics of the watershed, you can predict what the infiltration is going to look like during a typical storm event. And so then we've got the amount of rainfall excess that we know. And then we use some sort of a technique to predict what the hydrograph will look like based on the rainfall excess. And that's what we're going to do today with unit hydrographs. The reason you've got your computer out is because there's a certain method that, that says if you've, got a cer if you've got an inch of rain or if you've got a centimeter of rain, there will be a typical hydrograph. And then you just scale your hydrograph based on how much rain you actually got, not based on that one inch. but you just sort of uh, make your graph normalize to how much precipitation excess there was. And then this last step is just showing that you'd subtract out the base flow because you want to know how much of your hydrograph is uh, going to be a result of the wet weather event, not because of the groundwater flow that's always in the, in the stream. Okay, so here's the unit hydrograph. This is the, the meat of today's lecture as far as problem solving goes anyway. It says that, let's assume that there is a unit of rainfall. So it doesn't matter what unit system you're in. Maybe if you're in traditional units, you'd say, I want to know what does my watershed look like? What happens to my watershed when there's one inch of rainfall? Or if you're in uh, traditional units, I mean, so SI units, then it might be one millimeter of rainfall excess does what for a hydrograph? You know, how much? peak runoff is there, what's the time to peak, and then in the unit hydrograph method, then the, the actual rainfall, you just increase and decrease the size of your unit hydrograph depending on what the actual rainfall excess was. So once you know what a watershed does to an inch of rain, then you can use that knowledge to predict of what it will do for two inches of rain. In theory, maybe it will just double the runoff. It's not that simple, but that's, that's the approach. And it's a pretty good estimation when you don't have anything else. When you can't do anything more sophisticated, a unit hydrograph is a, a perfectly acceptable way to proceed. But there are some assumptions there. We can think of these as the weaknesses. Like, why isn't the unit hydrograph the best method? You know, why are we going to ultimately work towards something that's more sophisticated? It's because it assumes the rainfall intensity is constant. And of course, that's not true. We know that there is a temporal distribution in rainfall. The typical pattern is that it will start raining very slowly and work towards this period of high intensity rain. And then the rainfall intensity tapers off again. So this unit hydrograph method is similar to the rational method because the rational method also assumed constant intensity. And that's it's not realistic. We have a way around it. Um, it assumes that the rainfall is uniformly distributed. So back to this figure of where is it raining, the unit hydrograph assumes that the rain is everywhere in the watershed. And it's raining the same amount at the top as it is at the bottom. 
and it also assumes that the rainfall just instantly starts falling on everything at the same time. It's not like that it's mo the clouds are moving one direction or the other. Now, you know, in reality, the clouds do move from one direction or another. So you know, this assumption that we're making, it's an acknowledgment that we can't handle all of the different factors that influence the, the hydrograph shape, that we're just going to have to ignore that when we do the, the uh, unit hydrograph method. The time increment is constant, meaning that uh, it always is going to rain the one inch of rainfall uh, in the same period of time as when you reapply the hydrograph. And the, the watershed isn't changing. Um, it means that you, if you developed your unit hydrograph 10 years ago, then there wasn't any more development. You know, they haven't put in additional houses or paved any new roads. Everything's the same now as it was when you came up with the unit hydrograph that you're using. Um, so this is what we are going to do. This is a conceptual figure that shows how you use a unit hydrograph when there's actually a storm that's really long. Maybe the unit hydrograph that you made was one inch of rain in one hour period. But what if you want to use the unit hydrograph for a storm that is maybe three hours long? You have different time periods. There's a way of combining unit hydrographs together. And uh, this is the solution. This is what we're going to be doing in Excel. Excel makes it beautiful and easy to solve problems like this. But uh, this is kind of a representation of where the rainfall is coming from. And this will make a lot more sense once we work through this example. So let's do this together. Prepare a spreadsheet in Excel. We'll just fire up Excel and get into the weeds. Okay, so um, what we want to start off by having, it says in this problem statement here that uh, when there's an inch of rainfall, this is what our watershed does. So this is how the watershed responds to an inch of rainfall excess. And so then here is the precipitation amounts. This is the rainfall, not the rainfall excess. We're going to have to calculate the rainfall excess. And the problem statement tells us to assume abstractions of 0.3 inches per hour. So the procedure that we're going to go through is, first of all, we're going to, this is the precipitation. We want to calculate precipitation excess for each hour. And then we're going to use that along with this unit hydrograph. This is what happens when there's one inch of rainfall. So then what happens when there is 0.2 inches of rainfall? in the first hour. And then in the second hour, uh, um, there will be 0.7 inches of rainfall excess. Now, I really struggle to say rainfall excess when I should be saying it to mean rainfall minus the abstractions. Keep and don't show this message again. All right. So um, let's have here at the top first just the unit hydrograph. The unit hydrograph from the figure said that we had a certain time in hours and then it gives us a runoff Q in CFS per unit of inch of rainfall excess. That's, it's important to put the units on this one because understanding the units makes everything fall into place. I'm going to do this. Okay, so it's CFS per inch of rainfall excess. And what our watershed does is from zero to six hours, it has zero CFS, then 10, then 100, then 200, then 150, uh, then wait, we're off somehow. 200, 150, 100, and then 50. 
So this is what our watershed does when there's an inch of rain, and the inch of rain falls from zero until one. At zero, it starts raining, and it rains for exactly one hour, and how much does it rain? It rains so much that there's an a inch of rainfall excess. And so in this problem statement, we're told that assume abstractions of 0.3 inches per hour. So what that means is that it actually rained 1.3 inches, so that means we had one inch of rainfall excess. So CFS per inch of rainfall excess. Does anybody not understand the units of that? Because, I mean, that's, that's one of the key things is understanding this is CFS per, not inch of rainfall, but per inch of rainfall excess. Okay, so we've got that. Now, uh, that's our unit hydrograph. Now we're going to have a hydrograph. This is the, uh, gra it's rain versus time. Okay, so we'll have time in hours. We'll have the precipitation in inches. And then there's abstractions in inches. And rainfall excess in inches. Okay, so there is hour one, hour two, three, and four. And in hour one, it gives us in the problem statement, it says that it is 0 0.5, 1, 1 1.5, and 0 0.5. So I'm going to just transcribe that into Excel. We had 0 0.5, 1, 1 1.5, and then back to 0 0.5 again, All right? Yeah. Okay. So that's what the actual precipitation was. And the abstraction is 0.3 inches per hour. Now that's not realistic, right? Because what we know, because we're experts in infiltration, is we know the infiltration should be decreasing over time. But we'll just get over it and use the easy assumption because that's given. We could have done the smart thing and calculated green amped, but for now we'll just simplify things with this. And so rainfall abstraction is it's the precipitation minus abstraction, okay? So that's our rainfall excess is just the precip minus abstraction. And then we can drag that over sideways and it will do the same thing for hours two, three, and four. given in the problem statement. Yep. Assume abstractions of 0.3 inches per hour. So we're assuming that because of evaporation, infiltration, interception, and everything else, that 0.3 inches per hour of the rain is trapped and isn't going to be causing runoff. So of this 0.5 inches during the first hour, only 0.2 of it is available for runoff because the rest of it is lost to uh, abstractions. All right. Okay, so what we need to do now is begin our run runoff hydrograph. So what we've got so far is the unit hydrograph. And just to emphasize, I'm going to bold unit or uni. Unit, no. Okay, this is a unit hydrograph. And then I'm going to emphasize this is our hiatograph, so we don't confuse that and call it hydrograph accidentally. Okay, and then down here is the resulting runoff hydrograph. And I'm going to bold runoff because this isn't the unit hydrograph, this is the runoff hydrograph. Okay, so. It starts at, uh, we're going to have time in hours. So it goes from 0 to, we're going to need for it to go to 10. And that seems strange because our unit hydrograph only went to 6. But you'll see why in a minute, why we go all the way to 10 with that.
and then this is along the top we're going to have uh, what was the rainfall excess during our hour one, during hour two, hour three, and hour four. So we know that the rainfall excess during hour one was this amount, during hour two was that amount, and so on. I'm just, this is unnecessary to actually be referencing this another time because I could just click up here, but I want to really make it obvious that um, each of these each of these columns refers to a different hour. So this first column here is going to be what the watershed does because of that 0.2 inches of rain. So what's the response? Well, back up here is my runoff hydrograph. So it is going to be equals this amount. I'm going to anchor that with a Let's see, I want to be able to drag it, nope, I'm just going to anchor it like that. The amount times, and then back up here to the unit hydrograph. Okay, and then I can drag this down through hour six. All right. So does it make sense? If there was an inch of rainfall excess, then in hour one we would have 10 CFS as the flow rate. We didn't have an inch. In our first hour, we had 0.2 inches of rainfall excess. And so instead of 10 CFS, we have 2 CFS. So it's just scaled. So in hour two, if there had been an inch of rainfall excess, we should expect 100 but there wasn't an inch. During that first hour, there was 0.2 inches, and so that's why we now have 20, because it's 0.2 times 100 gives you 20. So what will be 0.2 times 200? Let's look down at hour three, 40 CFS. And so basically, this is showing us what happened when there was 0.2 inches of, uh, of rainfall excess. And that 0.2 inches is it, it fell between hours 0 and 1. And so what happened after that? Well, it was just 0 CFS. That's, that 0.2 inches of rain made its way through the watershed. Okay, so anybody want to guess what we're going to do for this next column? If we multiplied the unit hydrograph times 0.2 for the first column, what do you think we'll do for the second column? A similar thing, a similar thing, but what? Eventually we're going to add them. We're not going to add yet, but eventually, you're right, we're going to add them all together. There's an important difference though. When did the water fall? This 0.7 inches of rainfall excess, it, it happened uh, an hour later. It didn't happen in the same time as the 0.2. That 0.7 inches of rainfall excess happened an hour later, and so how should we handle that if it happened an hour later? In the spreadsheet, what should uh, we do, Alex? What do you think? Since it happened an hour later, okay, yeah, we are going to use a different precipitation rate, but what about the timing of it? Boom, you got it, that's right. It's going to be an hour later because the rainfall was an hour later. So we just add an extra zero. So here I'm manually typing in zero, zero. Okay, now, now that I'm in hour one, what looks like hour one, okay, so equals 0.7, anchoring it. And then I'm going to go back up here to my unit hydrograph. I'm going to start with that one. So there's two zeros. That's okay. It's sort of like I'm shifting this one down an hour. 
Okay, so drag that down through our seven. Okay, so do the amounts make sense? Mm, no, they don't. Let's see what went wrong here. Oh, I never multiplied it, I guess. Mm, okay, equals 0.7, anchoring it, times the unit hydrograph. I must have messed up on my keyboard. Times the unit hydrograph. Here it is. All right. And then I'll drag that down through. All right. Now it's making sense. No. Again. Let's see. Is it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. It's making sense. Because look. 0.7 times... The first time I see water is 10. So if there was an inch of rainfall excess, I should see 10. So I only had 0.7 inches of rainfall excess, so I'm seeing 7. So that wave of water, you can think of each one of these hydrographs as like a wave, right? The wave of water from the 0.7 inches is coming through an hour later than the wave of water that was due to 0.2 inches, okay? And then I manually type in 0 for the rest of them. Here's the 0, 0, 0. Okay, so now I've got 1.2 inches of rainfall excess. Okay, so I'm going to have manually zero and zero. And now that I'm in hour two, I'm going to start with the rainfall excess formula equals rainfall excess amount of 1.2 inches, anchoring that, and then multiply it up here by my unit hydrograph. All right and then drag it down. In this case, I'm going to drag it down through hour 8 and then put in 0, 0 manually after that. So are the amounts okay? Now, by now, we remember it was 10 CFS for the 1-inch unit hydrograph. And here we've got 1.2, so 12, and then 120, and 240, yes. But look, the peak is delayed an hour. Everything is delayed an hour. That wave of water is delayed an hour compared to the last one because the 1.2 inches of rainfall excess happened an hour after the 0.7 inches of rainfall excess. And then finally, here's the last one. I have to put in, let's see, how many zeros? I had two manual zeros before. Now I'm going to put in three. So one, two, three, and now I can start my formula. 0.2 anchor times the hydrograph, the unit hydrograph, and then I will drag that unit hydrograph formula down uh, through here. And manually type in zero. Here, each of these. Each of these cells, uh, it's CFS. Yeah, C because look up here at the unit hydrograph. The inches were CFS per inch of rainfall excess. And what we've done is we've multiplied this by inches of rainfall excess. So now we get CFS. That's a good question. So we're going to ultimately, this is going to give us a graph of time on the x-axis and on the y-axis will be CFS. Okay, so. What do you suppose the last thing we want to do is add it all up? So here we're going to have the sum. So it is sum of all four of those columns I see that some of you are doing a good job of putting in like shading and um, and, at, and that's a good thing because actually this is kind of confusing. We've got just so many different things going on here. Let me do the same thing. I'll I'll put in some borders here and then my sum. I'm going to bold that because it's the answer. This is uh, runoff. 
in CFS. So now what I could do is I could make a figure that shows time versus runoff. So I'm going to insert a scatter plot that has, I'm going to smooth it just because that's sometimes fun to do. Okay, select data, add a series. The x values are going to be time. And then the y values will be the hydrograph that was resulting from adding all those unit hydrographs together. Oh, look at that. That's a unit hydrograph at work. So I'm going to uh, pretty that up a little bit. And you really should never make a figure unless you're going to put axis labels on it. And I'm going to. Okay. Oh, it didn't change it. Format axis. Zero. That's more like it. Now that I've made the switch to uh, the new version of Excel, I've kind of forgotten how to do axis titles. There you go. So here we've got time and hours. Runoff, Q, and CFS. Okay, so what just happened? I mean, we were just like banging away at Excel and blah, 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 equation, anchor reference. But like, what was that? Um, the idea is that we know there's a certain watershed out there that when it rains, an inch of rainfall excess. So when you, you fill all the surface wetting and uh, you account for infiltration when there's an inch of rain left over, when there's an inch of rainfall excess, this is what happens in that watershed. So we wanted to know, all right, well, if, if this is what happens during one inch of rainfall that happens during an hour, uh, what happens when this is the precipitation? And so we basically just transposed this hydrograph. We scaled it and transposed it four times and added everything together because this is what it does for one hour of one inch of rainfall excess and then this is what really occurs. So this is a way of basically predicting the flow. Any questions about that example? So immediately after this class you can start working on the homework problem number one. The trick of this is though uh, the rainfall excess, this isn't one hour at a time. On, on the homework that I've given you, period one is four hours long. From, from zero till four, it's raining two inches, there's two inches, centimeters, two centimeters per hour of rainfall excess during that four hour period. So it's just like a curveball. I just wanted to make a little trickier. This is going to be a really wide spreadsheet because um, because the unit hydrograph I've given you is for one centimeter of rainfall excess during one hour. So you're going to have to repeat the same hydrograph four times for each four hour period. And there's four four hour periods. So this, this spreadsheet is going to have 16 columns of data, a 17th when you add it all together, and then an 18th if you consider that you're going to have time zero till whatever on the very far left axis. Yeah? No, the unit hydrograph is 
this one. So what I just made is a runoff hydrograph. If we were going to add a title in there, I would title this run off hydrograph when it r rains 1. Point, uh, what was it? Oh, point 0.5 point 0.5 inches during the first hour and then 1 inch during the second hour etc. It's the it's the runoff hydrograph. Yeah. Not the unit I'm glad that you asked that because it's important to emphasize the difference between the two over and over and over and over. <clears throat> so <clears throat> this is a conceptual diagram that shows what we're saying is during the first hour, this is how much of the watershed is actually contributing to flow. During the second hour, only this area is contributing to flow at the outlet. Like it's gradually more and more is making its way towards the outlet. Um, so maybe this makes more sense now. I showed you this conceptual figure. P is the precipitation amount and U is the unit hydrograph response. And so here is a table of U and here is a table of P where P is the rainfall excess that we calculated. So if you wanted to find the flow rate at any particular time, you multiply P1U1 for hour one at hour two. It's the precipitation that happened during hour two on area one and so on. We're out of time, so I won't be able to beat you over the head with this figure for too long. But you need to look at this, and this figure has to make sense to you. Um, so. That, that's it. That figure has to make sense to you. And uh, no, you're not. Or not, or you're screwed. Or else I'll feel bad inside. It'll hurt my feelings. So, all right. Have a great day, and I will see you on Thursday. We'll do more hydrographs then.